So on Monday, we did an example for a one-dimensional um, element, which it was, a, I think it was a wire or something, and we visualized it as a one-dimensional element. Today, I'd like to do another one-dimensional example. However, this time, instead of looking at the element in Cartesian coordinates, we're gonna look at the element in polar coordinates, and you'll see why in just a second. So for this next example, let's consider a wire that essentially has a circular or quarter circle shape. So this is a wire. We know that because it's a wire, it's a physical element, it's a three-dimensional element. However, let's say that this wire is so thin that we can treat it as a one-dimensional element. We know that this wire forms what's essentially a circular shape with a radius of R, okay, capital R. So this is my element. I'd like to find the centroid of this wire. So then how can I find the centroid of this wire? Well, we'll notice that we can repeat these steps. However, coming up with an equation in terms of x and y is gonna leave us with a pretty nasty integral. So instead of using Cartesian coordinates, we may uh, benefit from switching this problem into a polar coordinate problem. Now, Cartesian coordinates look at everything in terms of x and y, right? So in terms of two uh, perpendicular axes. What about polar coordinates? What do you think are, are the terms through which we can use polar coordinates? All right, Lorenzo, any ideas? Do you know what polar coordinates are? No, not really. It's okay, don't worry about it. So let's talk about that. So in Cartesian coordinates, we look at everything in terms of X and Y, correct? In polar coordinates, instead of looking at, at things in terms of horizontal and vertical components, we're gonna look at it in terms of a radius and an angle. So whereas Cartesian coordinates can locate points using X and Y coordinates, Polar coordinates will help us locate points using the radius and the angle. So for example, if you have a point, any point, we can find the point with Cartesian coordinates by saying, okay, this point is X and Y, where X is the horizontal displacement, Y is the vertical displacement, and we arrive at the point, right? But we can find the same point in polar coordinates by using radius and theta, which means if we want to find this point, we can say, okay, we find the radius of a circle, and then we find the angle in order to get to that point. So if you want to find, for example, a point along this line, we would essentially have the same theta, but we would vary the radius. We can move the radius by right, increase it or decrease it. So whereas in the x direction, elements move horizontally, in the y direction, elements move vertically. In the r direction, elements move from the center out, okay? So from the center of the circle, or in this case, the origin out. And in the theta direction, elements aren't really moving linearly, elements are actually rotating, okay? So polar coordinates are a way for us to visualize points in space by looking at it in terms of a magnitude and a rotation. Now you'll notice that this actually isn't very different from the vectors that you've seen before, because we know that vectors have a magnitude, which we simply call by the name of the vector, let's say F, and they have a direction, which we can find by finding the angle of the vector. So essentially we're taking that magnitude and that direction, and we are expressing them as if they were coordinates, just like X and Y. And the reason we wanna switch this problem to our X and Y components, is because we are going to find it much easier to integrate an equation in terms of r and theta rather than x and y. So let's see what I'm talking about. If I'm switching to polar coordinates, that means that my x and y directions need to be switched to r and theta directions. So I first wanna know what is the relationship between x and y and r and theta. So in this case, Let's suppose that I'm finding a random point here, x, y, okay? 
Now, Lorenzo, we can find this point by looking at the horizontal displacement, which is x, and the vertical displacement, which is y. However, we can find the same point by looking at the radius, which is r, and the angle, which is theta. Okay? So if radius is the r and the angle is theta, how do you think you can find the x coordinate of this point? Remember, the x coordinate will be just this horizontal displacement. How do you think you can relate this horizontal displacement to r and theta? Would it be r cosine theta? That's correct. What about the vertical displacement? r sine theta. That is also correct. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're just converting these x and y uh, measurements into r and theta measurements, which you may already be familiar with them, even though you may not have called them polar coordinates. You, we've already done some exercises, right, where we know that x would be our, our magnitude times cosine theta and y would be our magnitude times sine of theta, okay? So that's essentially what we're doing when we're setting polar coordinates. We are converting our x and y coordinates into r and theta coordinates. So let's go through our steps. We know that the first step to find the center of an element is to set a differential element at an arbitrary location x, y. But because we're going to use polar coordinates, we are going to set our differential element not at an arbitrary location x, y, but at an arbitrary location r, theta. So what does that element look like? Well, we know that our differential element, which should have a differential length dl, because we're looking at this as a one-dimensional problem, this differential element will be somewhere here. And I'm just exaggerating the size. It's actually supposed to be a really, really, really tiny element, so small that you can't even quantify its, its length, right? It's a differential element with a tiny length dl. And we're going to locate it at an arbitrary position, arbitrary coordinate point, which I'm going to call r theta. That is where this element is located. Now, after we set our differential element, we know that it's one dimension, so we'll use dl. And we know that it's going to be at some arbitrary location r theta, which can be anything right now. As long as it's somewhere in, in the body, it can be any, any coordinates. And we're going to locate the centroid, the coordinates of the centroid of the element. So, you know, we locate x squiggly and y squiggly, which are the coordinates of the centroid of the element, as functions of r and theta. So, we're going to locate the centroid x squiggly, y squiggly, as a function of r and theta. So, we have our differential element. And I'm going to draw my differential element here. I'm just going to exaggerate it a little bit. We know that this element is so small that the centroid of this element will be located at the same point of the element. Let me explain myself. This element is so small that we can see it as if it were just a point, r theta. So this element is so small that it is located at a point, r theta, and that means that the centroid of the element should be located at the same point, r theta. So we want to locate the coordinates to the centroid x squiggly and y squiggly of the element. And we know that the element is located at r theta. And we know that x squiggly should be equal to r cosine theta. Because this element is really small, so we treat it like a point. And that point is at r theta, and we know that x is r equals is r cosine theta. Therefore, x squiggly, the coordinates of the centroid, which are just equal to x, are equal to r cosine theta. So what do you think would be the coordinates to the y coordinate of the centroid? In other words, what do you think is the y squiggly for this uh, element? r sine theta? Yep, that's correct. r sine theta. If you get confused do, doing this analysis in polar coordinates, remember you can always try using Cartesian coordinates. However, the reason we're doing polar today is because Cartesian is going to give us an integral. It's going to be really hard to solve. 
But just in case, remember, x squiggly, because this is a point, x squiggly equals x, and x equals r cosine theta. y squiggly equals y, and y equals r sine theta, which is why I'm writing this expression right here. Then we are going to express our differential length. So we're gonna express our differential length dl in terms of one of our differential operators. We're gonna express dl in terms of either dr or d theta. And I think here's where we need to apply a little bit of judgment, right? We may have to make uh, some judgment calls. Let me try to focus this. Here's where we may have to make some judgment calls. You see, if we look at this element, okay, what do you think are the dimensions of this element? Well, we know that this element is going to have a length, right? a length that I'm gonna call dl. So how can we relate that length to r and theta? So, so let's just take it a step by step. This is essentially similar to an element of a circle, okay? So one element, of a circular one-dimensional object. So how do you think we can relate this element? And I'm gonna exaggerate its curve here, but how do you think we can relate this length, this curve length dl to my radius and my theta? How do you think we can find the length of any portion of a circle? I think we're gonna to have to review our geometry here. So let's say that I want to find the length of this portion of a circle. And all I know is the radius of the circle. And I know the angle, which I'm gonna call theta, the angle of this arc. Do you know how I can find the length of that arc? Exactly, right? The length of this arc should be simply equal to r theta. That's the arc length. Here, notice that even though this is a tiny element, it actually has the same geometry. It's a tiny element with an arc length dl. So in this case, right, we know that because this is a circular uh, wire, we know that the radius doesn't change. And if this element has a tiny, tiny, tiny arc length dl, then we can assume that the angle will be a tiny, tiny, tiny angle. So if we look at this uh, in terms of our circular wedge, we still have the same radius r, but because this element is so small, the length is so small, that means that the angle has to be really, really, really small. So I'm gonna say that this angle is called d theta because it's a tiny, tiny, tiny angle. So given this information, what do you think, or how do you think we can express dl in terms of radius and theta? So are we gonna use a section of the radius? Mm -hmm. Well, look at this arc length. In this arc length, we have radius times the angle. Now here, notice that the radius doesn't really change. So it's still the full radius, right? However, because the angle is just a tiny angle, we just call it d theta. So our differential length dl should be equal to radius times d theta. I'm glad that we're bringing this up because I think we're gonna have to review some more uh, polar coordinate exercises before the next test, but it's okay. The, the more we practice, the more we'll get used to it. So if you've never dealt with polar coordinates, um, just a, a few tips. These are the things you want to remember. If you've never dealt with polar coordinates, remember that x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. And I'm just going to add this here. Remember that the length, any length, right, dl equals r d theta. Okay? So if, you, if you've never dealt with polar coordinates, I would recommend that you remember these three relationships. Okay, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, 
and dl equals r d theta. Okay, so let's go back to our centroid, right? We've expressed dl in terms of, in this case, in terms of d theta. Okay, so you get the expression dl equals r d theta. And now, finally, we go to the last step of this problem, which is to integrate. So if we're going to integrate this uh, expression, we know the equations here, right? We know that the centroid will be equal to the integral of x squared by dv over the integral dv. However, this is a one-dimensional object, so we're not going to use dv, right? We're going to use dl, which is a one-dimensional body. So we know that x bar will be equal to the integral of x squiggly el, because it's a one-dimensional body, divided by the integral of dl. Now that's good, but we don't want to deal with these uh, Cartesian coordinates. We would like to deal with polar coordinates. So then what does that give me? My center will be equal to the integral of x squiggly. So is there anywhere in these steps where we came up with a relationship of between x squiggly and our polar coordinates r and theta? Yes. So x squiggly would be equal to r cosine theta. That's correct. We know that x squiggly equals r cosine theta. So instead of x squiggly, I'll write r cosine theta. And now we have dl. But from step number three, we've already expressed this dl in terms of r and theta. So dl, as you can see here, is equal to r d theta. So instead of dl, I will write r d theta. Likewise, in the denominator, I have the integral dl. And we know that dl equals r d theta. So the integral of r and d theta. Now, we need to set up our integration limits, right? So in this case, this uh, wire is not infinitely, it's not an infinite wire, right? It has a starting point and it has an ending point. Now, because in this case, our integral operator is d theta, that means that we need to evaluate this integral from here all the way through here by changing the angle theta. So what do you think are the limits of integration for this uh, angle theta? Would it be uh, zero to 90 degrees? That's correct. Zero, right? All the way to 90 degrees. So our limits of integration will be zero. And just because I wanna make sure that I don't confuse any units, um, let's try to, whenever we use court, uh, polar coordinates, let's try to keep our units in radians. So we're using radians, this really wouldn't be 90 degrees, right? What would it be in radians? Pi over two. Yep, pi over two. So Lorenzo, I'm not saying that you were wrong. It is zero to 90 degrees, but because sometimes our thetas may not be inside the angle, we may want to express everything in term, inside a sine or cosine function. We're gonna want to switch those degrees to radians, okay? So we get zero to pi over two, and we get r times r, I'll just write r squared, cosine theta, d theta. Remember that when we're calculating centroids, our integration limits don't change. So we got zero to pi over two in the first integral, we're gonna get zero to pi over two in the second integral, r d theta. And you'll notice that this actually isn't very complicated because look at this integral. We want to integrate with relationship to d theta. Now, r represents my radius. Does this radius r change anywhere in this uh, wire? Does the radius change? We know the angle moves, but does the radius change? No, the, the radius is constant. Okay. So if the radius is constant, can I take it out of the integral? Yes. Okay. I'm going to take this radius r out of the integral. We know the radius in this case, r will always be this capital R, the radius of the wire. So I'll just call it capital R squared. And taking it out of the integral, I just get the integral from zero to pi over two of cosine theta d theta. Likewise, right? We know 
in the bottom that the radius doesn't change. So I'm going to take it out of the integral and I'm going to replace it with the radius of the wire itself times the integral from zero to pi over two of d theta. And hopefully you can see that this actually becomes a very easy integral to solve. So notice that, what's the integral of cosine theta d theta? What's the integral of cosine theta d theta? Anybody remember their integrals? Negative sine? Uh, sine, right? Yeah, remember uh, the derivative of cosine theta is negative sine, right? But the integral of cosine theta will be sine. That's correct. And then what's the integral of d theta? Just theta. Just theta. That's correct. So we have as just an easy integral. R squared sine theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. R theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. So we, we ended up here where we see that we have a, a, a more or less a simple integral to solve. And in fact, on Monday, I skipped solving the integrals because they were pretty rough. However, today I don't want to skip these integrals because I do want to, um, you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that we're just going to leave these integrals unsolved and just call it a day, right? We also need to be able to solve integrals. So in this case, we ended up with x bar equals r squared times the integral from zero to pi over two of cosine theta d theta. And then the denominator, we ended up with r times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of d theta. Now, in this case, we get that x bar would be equal to r squared. And we already agreed that the integral of cosine theta should be sine theta. And this evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. And then in the bottom, we have r, and the integral of d theta is simply theta, also evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. So what does this give us? OK, so we get sine of pi over 2 minus sine of 0. What is sine of 0? Zero. Yeah. And the sine of pi over 2, remember that pi over 2 is 90 degrees. So the sine of 90 degrees is 1. So this just really gives me r squared on the numerator. So now we go to the denominator. We get r times pi over 2 minus 0. So it's simply r times pi over 2. We can rearrange this a little bit. R squared cancels out with one of the R's, and we end up with two times radius divided by pi. And that is the X coordinate of the centroid of this element. Now, oops, wrong element, of this element. Now, notice one thing. Even though we use polar coordinates, we can still get an x coordinate from them, right? Because that's what the problem asks us. It asks us to find x bar, y bar, not r bar, theta bar, x bar, y bar. So even though we switch to polar coordinates, we can still apply the same equation and arrive at an answer. Now, I'm sure some of you may be wondering, why do we have to go through the entire trouble of switching to polar coordinates? So let me um, just give you some ideas of why. If we were to switch to, or if we were to use Cartesian coordinates, x and y, what do you think would be the relationship between dl and dx and dy? We know that dl should be equal to square root of dx squared plus dy squared. And in the last uh, problem that we solved on Monday, we did solve something like that, where we ended up with uh, square root of dx squared and dy squared. But we ended up with a pretty nasty integral, you may remember. And I'm not sure if anybody tried to solve the integral, but if you did, that integral uh, included a lot of really weird terms. It was, like I said, it was a really, really nasty integral. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and guess that none of us actually managed to solve that integral manually without any help from a calculator. Is that correct? Or was anybody able to solve it without having to use a calculator? 
Yeah, it was a hard integral, right? But um, I didn't want to use that example to discourage you. Rather, I, I did that example on Monday to show you that switching to polar coordinates, which is what we did here, actually turned our integral into a pretty easy one. So imagine if you had to integrate, right, y squared square root of y squared minus something, right? It, it's going to be a really hard integral. But if we switch to polar coordinates, our integral becomes really easy. And that's why I want to stress the importance of knowing polar coordinates. Now, because uh, most of us aren't very familiar with polar coordinates, I'm going to try to include more polar coordinate examples um, in, our, in our future lectures so that we can get used to using them, okay? Now, we found x bar. Let's just find y bar. Remember, y bar is equal to the integral of y squared root dl over the integral of dl. However, from step number two, we found that y squiggly, you can see here, y squiggly is equal to r sine theta. I'll write it down. y squiggly is equal to r sine theta. And from step number three, we found that dl equals r d theta. So dl equals r d theta. The denominator doesn't change. It's actually going to be the same, right? The denominator is simply the integral of r d theta. Now, remember, when we're using x and y, uh, when we're solving these integrals, the limits of integration don't change. So my limit will still be from 0 to pi over 2. We already established that r can be taken as a constant because, as you can see here, r actually doesn't change. It's just a constant radius. So I get that y bar will equal r squared times the integral from zero to pi over two of sine theta d theta. And we already know that the denominator remains the same. Again, a pretty easy integral to solve. If you see this, if you've solved this before, you probably have in your calculus classes, this just gives me r squared times the integral of sine theta is negative cosine theta. And this evaluated from 0 to pi over 2 divided by r times theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. So what does this give me? Well, what do I have? I have negative cosine of pi over 2. Remember, pi over 2 is 90 degrees. So what's the cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. Okay, and then zero. we have, that's correct, thank you. And then we have minus negative cosine of zero, and we know that cosine of zero is one, minus negative becomes positive. So this just becomes r squared times one, which is just r squared. In the denominator, we have the same thing, r times theta as pi over two, so r times pi over two minus zero, which is r times pi over two. And hopefully you can see a pattern here. My R's cancel out and I get two R over pi. And we see here something interesting for a circular um, wire, the centroid actually has the same coordinates in the X and the Y direction. So that's an example of a centroid. It, it's pretty nasty. Uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can tell from your reactions or actually your lack thereof that this is not a very easy topic to grasp. However, that's why we're separating two whole weeks for it, so we can have enough time to go over as many problems as we can. 